thanks so much for stopping by and uh, checking out this sermon video. Just want to encourage you as you listen to this sermon uh, that this is just a supplement to your faith, to your walk with Jesus. Don't rely on this solely. I just encourage you to get involved in a local church if you uh, already are not. If you are looking for a local church, I'd encourage you to check out Center Point Church. Uh, we'd love to see you uh, be a part of our community. Uh, we have different groups that meet as well uh, throughout the week, Bible studies that uh, you can be a part of. Uh, as well, maybe it's on your heart that you'd like to help us in some way financially. Uh, a lot of man hours go into making our videos, into our production on Sunday morning. And if that's on your heart, check out centerpointchurch.ca and you can see how you could help us as well. You can check out our Facebook page, Center Point Church. Uh, like and follow us. Uh, God bless. If you have your Bibles today, Go to 1 John chapter 4. That's where I'd invite you to turn. As we've been looking through this book, uh, we have seen John basically do three things repeatedly. So first of all, the very first chapter of the book especially, John's concerned to make sure that we as Christians understand the relationship of sin and holiness in the Christian life, that we're able to understand that. Because on the one hand, John wanted us to know that as believers, we would still struggle with sin. So if you're here today and you know Christ is your Savior, the reality is you and I still struggle with sin. But on the other hand, John wanted to make sure that we strove for holiness in the Christian life that we're seeking to be conformed to the image and likeness of Jesus, that we're realistic about the sin that we still face, that the sin that we still have, and at the same time, we're striving to be like Jesus. We're, we're actually pursuing holiness in our life if we follow Jesus. That I know that's not popular in 2019, but holiness is a worthwhile pursuit that we would pursue Jesus in that way. And he was having to speak about this subject because there's teachers who were coming into his congregation and they were teaching, once you become a Christian, you no longer sin. And therefore, because you no longer sin, you can live whatever way you want to. So all they were teaching was your spiritual status changes, but you can do whatever you want with your body because you are a Christian. And John goes, that's absolutely not what Jesus would teach. That goes against his word. And he's very clearly and firmly opposing the false teachers. Secondly, in connection with that, John has in this book been giving Christians characteristics whereby we can tell the difference between uh, a true teacher of the gospel and a false teacher. And he gives these characteristics throughout. And Jesus actually did this with his disciples. And we're going to see that in, later today. But John also does this. And in this book he gives us these tests. Whereby we can tell a true prophet, a true teacher from a false prophet. So he goes, here's sort of a test for a true teacher of Christ's word from one who claims to be a teacher of Christ's word and is actually a false teacher. And then thirdly in this book, John gives us a test that we can apply to ourselves so that we can answer the question, do we see a work of grace in our own hearts? Like, do you see that your life has been changed by Jesus? Are we in Christ? Are we growing in Christ? Uh, I think one of the dangers in our churches today is we have many people who think they're in Christ, but their lives aren't marked by obedience with Jesus. So John goes, let's, let's do a test here. Let's find out, do you really know Jesus? Is he your savior? Do you really get that? Do you live for that? Do you understand that? Or is it just in your thoughts? Is it... You get the concept, but it hasn't changed your life. And John, in particular, in this book, has given us a doctrinal test. So what do we think about Jesus? A moral test. Are we obedient to God's word? A relational test. Do we love? Like, do we really love, tangibly love, our fellow believers in Christ, those who are now friends in Christ to us? Do we truly love them? 
And then John applies and states those tests in various ways in order to give us the symptoms maybe of our own hearts. So in this passage today, John is dealing with the issue again of giving us discernment regarding false prophets or false teachers. So we're going to hear God's word in 1 John chapter 4, but before we do, I'm going to pray for us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, this is your word, and the scriptures say that it's a lamp to our feet, it's a light to our path, and it's also meant, uh, it's also meant to search out our hearts. It pierces even to the joints and to the marrow, and it divides down to the deep things of the heart, the deep things of the soul, the deep things of the spirit. We pray, God, that you would search us out. We pray that you would change us, that you would correct us where we're wrong, that you would instruct us, and that you would grow us up in your truth, that you would enable us to understand it, to really believe it, that we would embrace your word, that we would walk by it. I pray these things in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. 1 John chapter 4, verses 1 to 6, if you have a Bible... Follow along, it'll be on the screen as well behind me, but this is what we read. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. And by this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God, and every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, of which you have heard that is coming, and now it is already in the world. You are from God, little children, and you have overcome them, because greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. They are from the world, therefore they speak as from the world, and the world listens to them, and we are from God. He who knows God listens to us. He who is not from God does not listen to us, and by this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. So to sort of kick off in explaining these verses, I've asked two people to come up. They're going to come up at this time, uh, Darcy and Andrew. I've asked Darcy, those of you who know Darcy, uh, he's a Pepsi drinker at breakfast. Uh, and I've asked Darcy to come up and de defend that. Why is Pepsi better than orange juice? Now, Andrew's very passionate about food, etc., works in a kitchen, and uh, we're inviting Andrew to defend why orange juice is more superior than Pepsi at breakfast, all right? So they're going to come up at this time. I've given them a few moments. Is Darcy here? Yeah, come on down. Both of you, now's the time. Yes, welcome them, thank you. <laughs> We'll let the guy who's super healthy go first, Darcy, who drinks Pepsi at breakfast. Why is it better than orange juice? First of all, I'm doing you a favor, so stop making fun of me. <clears throat> and I don't really think Pepsi is better than orange juice. However, uh, I prefer Pepsi to orange juice because I like the little burn. It gives you a little rip in your throat, a little blast of caffeine in the morning, help you wake up. And it comes in a convenient can. You can take in the car, you can do whatever you want. I don't have a whole lot of time to think this through, uh, but that's my argument. Right on. Thanks. Orange juice has the recommended uh, dose of vitamin C you need every day, so that's very important. And it's part of the uh, no complete nutritious breakfast. And also, Jesus drank orange juice. <laughs> right on. All right, thank them. <laughs> Oh, man. He said Jesus, I guess. Now, the reason I invited them up is because as we talk even about Pepsi in orange juice, for example, we live in a day uh, when discernment uh, has been thrown out the window. Uh, it's been said that orange juice is great at breakfast. It's a very healthy drink that you can have. We've heard that over and over again. I remember growing up, sitting at my table. But since I got into, like, I'm at that stage in my life where I'm going through the grocery store uh, and I'm looking 
at what's on the boxes and cans. I don't know if anybody else is at this stage. Some of you just throw it in the cart. I used to be there, but now I'm like, what does this have in it? What am I about to put in my body? All of that. And, and I've learned a lot about the grocery store. Like, I wasn't a big fan of it, but now I'm like, this is awesome. And I'm learning things, like people will come up to me and they'll be like, what are you doing here? And I'm like, for real? What am I doing here? Hunting elephants. No, I'm buying groceries. That's what I'm doing here. And I'm reading backs of boxes. And I'm going, oh, I thought that was healthy. And I'm seeing all this advertisement on the front of them, like if you basically 100% fresh, all of this stuff. So I have a little video. I want you to watch it now. Juice commercials would have you believe that every sip comes right from the tree. Right. Orange juice is totally natural. Look, there's a straw right in the orange. It's like I'm drinking straight from the fruit. Man, you really are gullible. Yeah? Even not from concentrate orange juice is just as processed as any other mass market food. Orange juice has an extremely short shelf life, so to stop it from spoiling, manufacturers extract all the oxygen from the juice. <laughs> Oxygen removal complete. But that process also removes all the orange flavor. It just tastes like sweet. Right. So manufacturers artificially jam it back in by using flavor packs. No, oh, that can't be natural. It's not. The taste that you know as Tropicana, Florida's Natural, or Minute Maid was actually designed in the same lab that makes perfume for Calvin Klein and Dior. Oh, citrusy. <laughs> the trick is, since the flavor packs are technically made of orange byproducts, they don't have to write artificially flavored on the label. But they are. Well, if it's all oranges, who cares? Yeah, flavor packs aren't bad for you, they're just super interesting. <laughs> uh -huh. Well, great. What's bad for you about orange juice is the sugar. What sugar? Kind of a strong reaction. You didn't know this? OJ is loaded with it. An eight ounce glass of Tropicana contains 22 grams of sugar. That's almost as much as a Pepsi, which makes sense since Tropicana is owned by Pepsi. There we go. So, because they came short notice up front, I have Pepsi for Darcy. You can come get that. I'll give it to you now. Because you can drink Pepsi just as well as orange juice for breakfast. And because Jesus drank it, Andrew, maybe we'll serve it at communion next week, right? There we go. So basically in our culture, we have this thing where we just believe the facts right away. Now, I want you to sort of swing that over here into the church culture. And I want you to think about this. Because this always amazes me. Because in our day and age, in our generation, in the times in which we live, I want to suggest that second only to our need for a heart of holiness is our need for discernment. Like, we should be holy if we follow Jesus, pursuing after it. But then we should be very discerning. We live in a day and age where the church is worldly, where the world is in the church, and the church is like the world. Even though the scriptures say we are the called out ones, meaning if you know Jesus, there are going to be aspects of your life that look totally different. You're going to do things that honor Jesus, and a lost world will look at you and go, why? What's the reason? What's the purpose? And we need a church which has a heart for holiness, to be sure. So we live in this day where we believe many things in our church culture. And our witness to the world as evangelical, Bible-believing, gospel-preaching, Christ-exalting Christians is being hampered by the fact that our lives are too much like the world. That hits home, right? That if we look at our life, that many times it's too much like the world. And we have this great need for holiness. But I suspect that the second only to the great need of, need of dealing with worldliness and cultivating holiness in the life of Christians is this need for spiritual discernment. Spiritual discernment that can tell the difference between true and healthy and good 
right Bible teaching and that which claims to be Bible teaching but is not true. It's not healthy. It's not good. And it's, in fact, very destructive to the Christian life. So you need the ability to distinguish between Bible truth and Bible error. Now, the ability has been eroded in our generation because of the loss of Bible knowledge. Now, many times I'll share, I, I grew up in a culture in the church that was very legalistic, and there were some things that go that were dangerous about it. But one of the most important things that I'm grateful for is as I grew up in that culture, I was taught properly. I was taught scripture. Uh, I grew up even in the Awana program. Not, I'm not here to say, like, bring Awana back, etc., and that's what we're missing. But, like, we memorized verses. I knew scripture, just not... Uh, just not in my mind, but in my heart. Like there'd be moments as a child and as a teenager and a young adult that I'd just be out uh, around and all of a sudden a verse would pop up. Or I'd be in a situation and all of a sudden that verse I memorized when I was seven years old would just come to my memory. And I knew the books of the Bible. Like I remember going to... Uh, Winnipeg and becoming a youth pastor. This is when I first entered ministry 16 years ago. And I still remember my first lesson. I said, turn to the book of James chapter 1. These teens on a Sunday morning went to Calvin, Calvin Christian School. It was there. So they're all going to Christian school. Their parents all have them at the church. And here's what I get back as I say, turn to James chapter 1. Uh, pastor Howie, is that old or New Testament? And I was like, for real? Old or new? Like, don't you know the books of the Bible? And none of them knew. There was like no knowledge. And now we're here, 2019. And Bible knowledge has just been thrown out the window. In fact, George Barna, I used to read him back in like 2004, 2005, and he's written now for 15 years. Just how little Bible people know about scripture and how Bible-believing Christians are no different than non-believers, that they're doing the same things as non-believers, and they don't feel convicted, they don't feel challenged by it. See, if you don't know God's word, it's very difficult, isn't it, to know the difference between truth and error, being taught about God's word. Uh, this past... Uh, so, uh, fall, I went to Malagash Bible Camp uh, to speak at a youth retreat. And before going, the camp director called me up, and he's like, normally I would ask the speaker doctrinally it, what they believe and if they agree to what we stand for as a camp, but I've followed Centerpoint Church, and I'm not worried about that. And I was grateful for that, that at Centerpoint, we're, we're praying and we're trying our best to go, right, here's God's word. We're going to proclaim it. Like, there are parts of scripture that if you preach, for example, topically, you just don't go to. And I've had to preach through books of the Bible like Genesis, and I can't skip those tough topics, those tough issues. And I've had people write me and go, I disagree with you. And I go, that's okay. You're allowed to disagree. But I need to be faithful in what God's word is proclaiming. And this is why John is so concerned to call us in this passage to spiritual discernment. And you'll see in the very last words of the passage that his point is that he wants us to be spiritually discerning. Look at verse 6 and the final sentence. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. He wants the believer to be discerning of that which is true and to be able to distinguish it from that which is false. Some of you, you don't know this yet, but if you're found in Jesus, uh, for some of you, you, you might have a spiritual gift of discernment. It's actually a spiritual gift. Some people, the Holy Spirit has given you that gift where you're able to discern between truth, what is truth, what is false. You're able to discern different things that happen. 
and that comes easy. But for the rest, maybe you don't have that spiritual gift. But that's not an excuse not to be discerning between truth and error. Uh, I don't say too much, but I'd say this is one of the spiritual gifts that the Spirit has given to me. I remember being in my freshman year of Bible college, and we had a guest speaker come in, and he made a statement about salvation that was not biblical at all. And it was very, I'll just say, you'd have to really be listening to get it. And I remember hearing him, and everything inside of me, it was like an alarm went off. No, that's not the truth. That's not right. And I'm like, okay, what's going on? And I examined what he said. And, and here's the thing. It sounded nice, but it's not what the Bible truly declared. See, we need discernment between what is truth and what is false. Because we're living in this day where... I'll just say we, we're very open. We don't want to offend anyone. We, we, we don't like confrontation. We, we don't want to maybe challenge some things that we would go, that's not what the Bible declares, uh, especially since we're Canadians and we're really nice, right? And we always apologize, etc. At least that's what the Americans think of us. But we need to think this through. Like, are you passionate about the truth of God's word? Are there some hills that you would actually climb and go, you know what, I would climb that hill and I would fight because I know the truth of scripture on that issue. Now in this passage, John says three things to us about this. First of all, he wants us to be discerning about Jesus. And you'll see this in the first three verses. Secondly, he wants us to realize that this is a spiritual matter. It's just uh, not an intellectual matter. It's not just a matter of being smart. It's not even a matter of just knowing a lot of things about the Bible. It's a spiritual matter to be able to distinguish between truth and error. And you're going to see that in verses 4 and 5. And then thirdly, in verse 6, John will make it clear that one test of a true prophet and a false prophet is whether they, the prophet believes the Bible. There are many people who are declaring scripture who don't even believe it's God's word. They're quoting it. And they don't even believe in Jesus. The way John puts it is like this. Those who know God listen to us. Who is the us? Well, that's the apostles. So John says, those who know God listen to the apostles. In other words, he's saying, those who are true prophets listen to the apostles' teaching. So where do you find the apostles' teaching? In the word of God. Those who are not true prophets, he says, do not receive the teaching of the apostles. They do not receive our teaching. They reject the teaching of the word. So in these six verses, John is giving to us, uh, as Christians, tests whereby we may discern, get this, not the spirit, but the spirits. He's giving us tests so we can discern between the spirits. Now, in John's congregation, apparently, there's some people who were very impressive, and then people who were impressed by their teaching. But those people were teaching things about Jesus that were incorrect. So, we live in a day that's all about the celebrity. It's all about the popularity, even in the church culture. Like, we fall for this all the time. I remember individuals who'd watch, for example, the Grammys, those type of shows, and they'd be like, I can't believe that Lady Gaga is a Christ follower. She said, I want to thank God. She's a Christian. And I'm like, that's interesting. So a mark of Christianity is you win an award, you stand up and go, I just want to thank God. Does it go deeper? We live in this celebrity culture. I remember there was a popular preacher, and uh, he was teaching this false doctrine that 
we are not human. We're actually little gods. And I was like, that's not what the Bible says. And I remember just mentioning the teaching, not the, not the preacher, wasn't attacking the preacher. I was saying how teaching that we're little gods is unbiblical. That doesn't line up to what scripture says. And I remember I had a couple leave the church and they were like, we tithe all our money to this preacher. And I'm like, so you don't give to the local church at all? No, we just give to this preacher and you're just jealous of them. And I was like, that's interesting. Because I didn't even say his name, but you know the teaching. So let's talk about the teaching. Do you really believe that God created us as little gods? That we're growing into the ultimate God and someday in heaven we're going to be gods? Do you really believe that? And they're like, well, if he teaches it, he's a man of God and he wouldn't teach false truth. And I just had to leave it. No discernment at all. No discernment as to what God's word actually says. And so John writes to them, and his very first words are, Beloved, do not believe every spirit. Isn't it interesting that in 1 John 3, 23, he can say this, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And then just two verses later, the very context, he can say, But don't believe everything you hear that's said about Jesus Christ. So believe on Jesus, but then Two verses later, don't believe everything you hear that's said about Jesus. Believe on Jesus Christ, but don't believe everything you hear. So often Christians mistake uh, faith for this tendency to be ready to believe something as real and true right away. So somebody uh, just gets up, makes a statement that sounds really cool and Christianized, and we go, oh, that's awesome. And we stop there. We don't really dig deeper. And then maybe some years go by and we realize, you know what? They're, they're not even a Christian at all. And so John is desirous that we would believe the truth, not just believe anything. Uh, this happens, like I mentioned, at the, at the Grammy. Someone will stand up. It happens in sports. I was actually impressed and... Uh, yeah, I am a big Eagles fan, so I don't mind going there. We had a rough year this year, but that's okay. We'll redeem it. Um, but it was media day right before the Super Bowl when the Eagles just beat the Patriots in a glorious game. And uh, at media day, Zach Ertz was sitting down at a table, and the reporter said, we understand you're a Christian. And I'll never forget what Zach did. He went, absolutely. Absolutely. I'm a Christian, football's not everything, but let me tell you something, I'm just not a Christian, I'm a disciple of Jesus, and then he went for 10 minutes on what a disciple of Jesus is really all about, and I was like, that is why the Eagles are God's team. <laughs> because they use this platform to make much of Jesus, right? So, I'm just saying, like, it goes deeper. And I went, yeah, Ertz, you're right. Makes me prouder to be an Eagles fan. Just throwing it out there. If you're looking for a football team, come to the Eagles. So John is desirous that we should believe the truth and not just believe anything or everything. So Bible faith, Christian faith, saving faith is not faith in faith or a leap in the dark. Here it is. Faith is a firm belief and a trust in the person of God and the promise of God that is true and sure. And so it is not an act of uh, intellectual suicide. Like to be a Christian isn't like just jumping off a cliff, all right? There's a lot of fact behind it. And it's, I'll just tell you, it's very easy for a Christ follower, or it should be, to go, I have placed my faith in the person and the work of Jesus. And just be secure in that and hold to that. In fact, I would actually argue that it is not the Christian who must check his brains at the door. I've had some people go, oh, you're a crazy Christian. You, you don't even think through stuff. You just go, faith. And I'm like, Really? No, trust me, I think through stuff all the time. But I'm so grateful for the faith 
that God has granted to me. See, we have that when we believe in Jesus. I would just say this. It is the unbeliever, I believe, who must check their brains at the door when they attempt to do justice to this crazy and fallen world in which we live. Because the believer faces this world with both faith and discernment. The unbeliever faces it with unbelief and denial, neither of which is rational. So John is saying, be discerning. And when someone comes and teaches you, like examine that, measure him according to scripture. It's just like Paul's special praise or Luke's praise of the Berean Christians who when they heard Paul teach, they just didn't run and accept it right away. Like, I grew up in the culture where if your church said it or if your pastor said it, you believed it because of that. Like, I had discussions where people would go and we'd be talking about something deeper in the faith. And I'd go, why do you believe what you believe? And here's what they said. Because my church taught me. And I'm like, that is so weak. Because my pastor said this or because my bible school taught me that i'm like no no what does god's word say that's challenging like i hit a point in my life where i'm like i don't want to answer questions by going that's what my pastor said or that's what my church said i wanted to answer questions by going this is what god's word says i'm just a messenger declaring god's word because paul is teaching here Check what's being said. So these Bereans went back to their Bibles. They checked it. And they said, all right, what Paul is saying is exactly what the Bible's saying. And they tested to see what Paul's teaching was in accordance to God's word. And in this passage, John says, here's a test to apply to every teacher. So I'm here to tell you, don't believe everything I say. Like, I'm imperfect. I, I, I remember preaching sermons, and I've had some people come back to me, and they were like, Howie, did you notice that you said Jesus sinned? And I was like, really? And they were like, yeah, you got really passionate. You know that moment where you sort of lose your mind? And then you just say some things? Well, that came out. I know you don't believe it, but I just wanted you to know that. And I was like, thank you. So we went back through the video. We edit that part out of the message. I'm imperfect. I'm a human messenger. See, every preacher, every teacher would, would, would should at least acknowledge, like, we don't got this. Like, I don't have every answer to every question. There are some things I believe that you would go, man, you're crazy to believe that. And I'd go, maybe. But on the foundations of the faith, man, I, I just hold those close-fisted. I'm like, Jesus is the only way. Like, I have no other gospel. It's all I can declare. It's the only message I have. That Jesus died on a cross, was buried, and raised three days later, and the resurrection happened. Like, that happened. I can't deny that. I can't go against that. Those are solid foundations of the faith. But when it comes to Music style, preferences, man, just choose your style. And then have fun worshiping Jesus. We need to go deeper into God's word. We need to go, I have some convictions here. I hold to it. We need to examine what teachers are saying. And John goes, here's a test you can apply. It's in verse 2. By this you know the spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. That's the test, he says. That you can apply. In other words, John is giving a test by which you can know if someone is being led by the Holy Spirit or maybe they're being led by some other spirit. Is the person really of God? Are they indwelt by the Spirit? Or is the person of the world? Are they misled by the Spirit of this age? How can you tell? What is the test? Answer, verse 2. Every spirit which confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. So every summer, I'm walking my dog, and every summer, Mormons stop me. And they go, hi. And I go, hello. And then this conversation starts. And then I go, I'm a Christian. 
And they go, so are we. And then I go, no, you're not. And I'm a pastor of a local church here in Charlottetown. And they go, well, we're on the same team. And I'm like, no, Team Jesus doesn't have a reversible jersey. You might think that's mean, that's cruel. They're false teachers. So I say to them, answer this question. Do you believe Jesus is God from the beginning? No, we don't. Why would we believe that? I'm like, because the Bible says it and Jesus says he's God. So we're not on the same team. And then they always ask me this. Well, do you know any others who you could send us to who would listen to us? So I get all my Christian friends, say here's their numbers, call them, engage them, because they need to hear the true gospel. See, we live in a culture, and even in the church, where we go, how dare you say that Mormons aren't Christians? I'm like, examine their teaching. Are they nice people? Absolutely. Like, super nice. They'd probably come in and clean your house. I don't know too many Christ followers who would go on the street like, uh, sure, I'll come clean your house. No, I, I really don't. Now, it'd be cool if we met some Christ followers who would help people in those ways. But I'm like, yeah, you're, you're nice people, but being nice is in the gospel. And we live in this culture that accepts all religions, and I'm going, like, it's Jesus. What do people believe about Jesus? Like, get to the root of it. Instead, in our culture, I know back in Georgetown, if you're a Christian and Jehovah Witnesses come to your door, it's like, turn out the lights, dive behind the couch, nobody's home. And then they quote some crazy verse in James as to why we can't let them in our house. <laughs> I'm like, Tell them about Jesus. Tell them about the gospel. Tell them about how he's changed your life. Tell them about how he's God. Don't be running. Don't be fearful. We love Christ. We love the gospel. We proclaim the gospel. And uh, I'm just letting you know, I think it's pretty clear, that Mormons and Jehovah Witnesses, we're not on the same team. Okay? Okay? In other words, the Holy Spirit testifies to the reality of God in your life by causing you to own up to the truth about Jesus. So when you give a genuine confession of Jesus Christ, we can know that you are of God. We can know, okay, the Holy Spirit indwells this individual. Uh, write this down if you take notes. Believers are to apply a biblical doctrinal test to those who claim to be prophets of the Lord teachers now in this passage john is telling us that a teacher who teaches what the bible says about jesus is showing the mark of being a true christian teacher but that any teacher who denies the bible's teaching about jesus is not from god so in this passage the particular problem that they're facing is the denial of the humanity of christ these teachers are apparently not saying that jesus is not god they believe that. Do you see how our culture has changed, by the way? People want to believe today that Jesus was a man, that he was created, but they don't want to believe he's God. In this day, John's day, they don't want to believe he's a man. They accept the fact, oh, he's definitely divine. His deity is very clear that he is God. And if you sort of take your average religion course in the university, they'll tell you that the idea of Jesus' deity gradually evolved over the course of time. No, it didn't. It was right there from the beginning. They accepted it. The testimony of history says, no, like, that's not true. Like, this didn't evolve. It was always there. Nobody questioned the deity of Jesus in the history of Christianity. There was no serious challenge to it for three centuries. When the challenge came, it was so soundly uh, refuted by the early church that it took another 1,500 years before anybody even got up the nerve again to suggest anything that Jesus was not fully divine. So there's a period in church history where that was just a non-issue. Everyone just said, yeah, Jesus is divine. He's God. He's deity. 
the problem that people struggled with in the early church was, is he human? That, to me, you see, is a testimony to the truth of the gospel. They had no problem believing in the deity of Jesus, but man, they grappled with, was he fully human? And John is responding to the teachers who were denying that Jesus was fully human. He realized that it undercut the gospel. That's wrong. That's horrible teaching. If he was not a high priest who could sympathize, sympathize with us in all things except sin, then he could not be our redeemer who bore our sin as a human in our place. That's how John is thinking. And so this denial of Bible teaching about Jesus was a denial of the gospel, and then John meets that with strong rebuke and, and center point. You do not have to go far today. You can go on television, on the internet, on the radio, to find Christian teachers teaching false things about Jesus. It's very easy. And believers must be prepared to exercise doctrinal discernment when we hear people claim to be teaching God's truth. We need to measure the teaching according to God's word. Uh, here's what I've learned. When I am wrong and God's word is right, he wins. His authority trumps my authority. Uh, when I was in my fourth year at Bible college, I was placed in a church out in Miramichi, New Brunswick. This church loved the truth of God's word. The elders of that church were Bible-believing men. And one of them, I, he was sort of the patriarch of the group. His name was Morse. And I remember when I would preach and teach, Morse would watch me like a hawk. He did this for my whole first semester. Every Sunday morning when I'd preach, every Wednesday night when I'd teach, he would sit there with his arms crossed, no smile on his face, just staring at me. And I'm like, man, this guy has a hard heart. And then uh, my second semester started, and I was preaching one Sunday morning, and I looked out, and I, Moore's always sat in the back row, and uh, he was sleeping. And I thought, that's interesting. So I kept preaching. And then after the service, I said uh, to Morse, I noticed you really enjoyed my message today. And he responded, young fella, I've been listening to you for four months. You know the Lord. You love Jesus. You love the Bible. You're preaching the truth. I can go back to sleeping again. <laughs> now, that's not John's point. He's not saying, like, if you're in a church that declares God's word, nap. Have a good one. But the elder, but that elder here was convinced to discern between truth and error because he knew that would impact the lives of the people. I appreciated that. That he would examine that, that he would keep an eye on that. So verse 2 Basically, my conclusion of it is this. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit which sincerely confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh and which has a corresponding disposition of loving reverence and submission to Jesus Christ is of God. So the sign of the Spirit's reality is not merely the truth of the words coming out of the mouth of a prophet, but also the disposition of the corresponding uh, corresponding to the truth. So the Holy Spirit bears witness to the genuine, genuineness of a believer or a prophet in two ways. One is by producing the fruit of love. The other is producing this confession of doctrinal truth about Jesus. So there's love and truth. They always go together. Love and truth. Some people leave out the love. They have no love. They're all truth. And man, they're heavy hitters. I remember I shared this with some people. I, growing up in Georgetown, we did sort of door-to-door -door in a town of 650 people, just so you know, they, they know us. Uh, it's not one of those towns where you go, you have no clue who I am. And uh, we're knocking on the door, and they'd always pair us up. And there was one guy I never wanted to get paired up with because, man, he was a heavy hitter. And I'd, I'd get paired up with him, and I'm like, oh, no. And I'd go to, like, my friend's parents' house. <laughs> They'd answer the door, and this heavy hitter would be like, hey, do you know Jesus? And they'd be like, what do you mean? 
Are you born again? No. You're going to hell. And I'm like, for real? Do you have to open with that? Like, do you have love? Do you have compassion? Can we sort of go there first? So I'd go to school. My friends would be like, yeah, told my parents they're going to hell. My, I'm just sort of hanging out. Sorry. And everyone got to know that in the town, and all of a sudden our church became known as basically the no love church. It was just like you're those born againers who just tell us we're going to hell. I'm like, what a horrible reputation. It takes years to get past that. Verse 3, we know they're not from God. Uh, here's what it says. When we hear those who teach against what the Bible says, it's clear they're not from God. Second thing, discernment is a spiritual matter, verses 4 and 5. John says discerning this is not just a matter of being smart. This is a spiritual matter. So listen to his words. You are from God, little children. You have overcome them because greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. Now, you know like we could preach a whole sermon series just on that one phrase like that is major key it's filled with truth now you see what john is saying this isn't just a matter of you knowing more technical information about the bible than somebody else does this isn't a matter of you being smarter than somebody else and being able to discern truth and error this is a spiritual matter so if the spirit dwells in you he who is in you who is greater than the world so if that spirit dwells in you, that Bible knowledge that you have will not lie uncultivate it, but will be used to create in you a heart that's filled with love, a good conscience, a sincere faith, and it'll give you discernment. And that's why there are some very humble people in terms of their, I'll just say, intellectual capabilities. Like there are some brilliant people when it comes to the word of God, but they are so humble. And then there are some who are brilliant, but they're not humble. I'll never forget a friend of mine out west. He was, I, I still think he's one of the smartest guys I've ever met. He, he knew scripture. He grew up in the church. But Jesus didn't change his heart. He grew up bitter towards the church. And I, I remember one day he asked me to go to the church that he was at. And he was going to confront the minister over something. And I was sitting there. I'm like, yeah, I'm... Like, my friend's super smart, but he's so wrong here. And the pastor, he wasn't as intellectually smart, but I was like, oh, he's so right. Because my friend would bring up these points, and he'd be like, but that's not what the Bible says. I'm like, the pastor's so right. See, just because we're smart or we have intellect doesn't mean that if it's against what God's word says, that that trumps that. See, God's smarter than all of us. I'll never for, forget that moment, center point. And I want to tell you uh, that we need the kind of spiritual discernment. We need the Bible basically in our hearts so that we can discern uh, truth from error. Uh, I won't say his name, but when I served in Winnipeg, this one lady, I love her to death, but she'd always compare me to this... Uh, I just go, he's a false teacher. She's like, you remind me so much of him. And I'm like, no. Why? Because you smile. I'm like, tons of people smile. Why do I have to get compared to him? Because I open a Bible. Maybe he just has a spiritual gift of encouragement. So then I'm like, do I smile too much? I don't want other people to think that I'm like him. Because it's horrible teaching. Third point, the true prophet believes the Bible. Look at verse 6. We are from God. He who knows God listens to us. Who's the us? It's the apostles. And it says, and if you know God, John is saying you will listen to the apostles' teaching. So the apostles are from God. They're faithful teachers. And those who are faithful teachers and followers of Jesus will teach in accordance with them. The apostles are God's men. And so those who know God will accept their teaching and those who don't will reject it and they'll show that they're really of the world by rejecting the Bible's teaching. 
So center point, there are Christian teachers today who on a regular basis call into question the authority and the truthfulness of God's word. 1 John chapter 4, verses 4 to 6, especially says that anybody who tells you that this word is wrong is not of God. Now look up here, because I didn't say, like, I know I'm getting there, but I'm not an old grouch. I'm not a crazy legalist. I don't have a hate on people, but I didn't invent that. Anybody who tells you that the word is wrong and is not of God should not be listened to, should not even be entertained. John knew Jesus better than anyone. He lived with Jesus. The Last Supper, he reclined by Jesus. And John is the one who says that. Anyone who says that this isn't the word of God. Anyone who says that this book should not be believed, don't listen to them. Don't pay attention to them. Anybody who rejects the apostles' teaching doesn't know God the Father, doesn't know the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, church, that's a very important thing for us to remember today as we discern between truth and error. Because there are many people who claim to be agents of God, messengers of God, heralds of God, and they deny the word of God. And John says, you deny the teaching of the apostles, and you show that you are not of the God of the apostles. So we'll close with these two points very quickly. Here's the great assumption of this passage, the point of chapter 4, verses 1 to 6, is not merely to give us a doctrinal test for discerning false prophets. If it were, then verse 2 would not say, by this we know the Spirit of God. Instead, it would say, by this we know the Spirit of the Antichrist. The point of the verses is not merely to give a doctrinal test to recognize false spirits. The point is to give a test also to recognize the true spirit. And therefore, the test must be more than doctrinal because true doctrine by itself is no sure sign of the work of the Holy Spirit. Anyone can say true doctrines with his lips, but only the Spirit can make sinners really listen and really confess the truth of Jesus. So the great lesson that lies beneath the surface in the passage is that none of us will listen to the message of Jesus unless the mighty Holy Spirit overcomes our resistance and gives us ears to hear. So, I was really challenged the last year in this area. Howie, it's not about you sitting with a non-believer and debating and debating and walking away frustrated, going, why can't they see that? How it, it's deeper. They need the Holy Spirit to open up their minds to Christ and their hearts to Christ. And until the Holy Spirit reveals that and opens their hearts and minds, it's always going to be a challenge. So just love them. Because I'd sit with some of my family, I'd sit with some of my friends, and in my mind I'm like, come on, just get it. Not realizing that I would have never gotten it if the Holy Spirit didn't open up my mind, my eyes, my heart to the truth of the gospel. So my whole plan changed. So, for example, now when I sit with my dad, I'm just praying the whole time. I'm like, God, through the power of your spirit, open up his mind to the gospel of Christ. Let him see the beauty of Jesus. Let Jesus change his heart. And I'm loving him through that. I'm not getting frustrated. I'm loving him. And I'm going, all right, God, open this up. 
let the gospel just flood in and change him forever. And now when I sit with non-believers, I'm just going, I just need to show them I love them, I care about them, and I'm praying, Spirit of God, reveal yourself, because that's what we need. See, the great assumption between with verses 2 and 6 beneath it is that the hearing of the gospel with openness and confessing Jesus with loyalty is actually the work, the gift of the Holy Spirit. Not one of us in this room can save anyone. I'm just a sower of the gospel. All I do is plant seeds. But God saves. Like, I, I, I read through the book of Acts. And, and what got my heart was that it said, daily, the Lord was adding to their numbers. I'm like, what? Daily. The Spirit of God was opening up people's hearts. Like, people were getting saved on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday and Friday and Saturday and Sunday. And I'm like, man, we, we just put a big emphasis on church events, but... Like, who in our circle are we seeing God saving? Opening their heart to the truth of the gospel and the beauty of that. See, that can only be done by the power of the Holy Spirit. So I want to challenge you because I think you're probably like me. Uh, prayer sort of goes out the window and we try in our own human efforts to make things happen when, man, prayer should be the first thing. Like, if you're going to share your faith, pray, pray. Search your own heart, pray. Because here's what happens when you start sharing your faith. Your friends who know you really well start calling all the hypocrisy out in your life. And I go, that's good, that's good. So be humble, own it, and talk about Jesus. And say, oh, Jesus has paid for my past, present, and future sin. But I have a desire in my heart not to allow sin to reign. So yeah, I'm not perfect. Oh, I mess up. But I'm looking to my Redeemer. He can change your life. We'll close today in prayer. I'll invite our worship team to come up as I pray. Maybe you're here today and you don't know Christ as Savior, and I'd tell you that the Bible says that today is the day of salvation. I'd encourage you not to let this moment pass. If you're here and you don't know Jesus, the Bible says that if we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus, we believe in our hearts that God raised him from the dead, we will be saved. I pray that maybe today you would confess that, that you would acknowledge you're a sinner in need of an amazing, beautiful Savior, and that is Jesus. And that your life would be marked by what he did on the cross and the empty grave. I pray if you're here and you're a believer, like, or you've confessed Jesus and you're just living for yourself, you're living in sin, I'd tell you that, that God's not condemning you, but he's calling you to repentance. The Spirit is convicting your heart to come back to obedience. May you take that step today. May you walk in the power of the Holy Spirit. May you experience freedom. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen.